Never. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, my name is John MacArthur. I'll be uh, presenting for you this evening. Um, I am the technical services manager for Go Engineer, so I handle um, all inbound service work, um, largely SolidWorks Electrical, EDM, SolidWorks Manage. Um, but uh, for anybody that uh, has known me for a while in the industry, um, announcing this now. I wasn't supposed to start. <laughs> um, I'll turn on them early. <laughs> hey, doing well, what's up? How you been? Good. You doing the show? Uh, no. Eh, no. Okay. That's good. <laughs> you brought some toys with you? I did. Good deal. Yeah, yeah, that's the, right. that's the uh, presentation here showing how I model this thing. So, yeah, thank you. Just the mic again. Go. I don't. Uh, I don't have a mic, but I'm big and I can get loud, so I think we'll be all right. So uh, I've been running SolidWorks since uh, I guess 2001 plus. Um, it has uh, definitely been my software choice for a long time, and been an application engineer um, since 2007 or so, and, and worked my way up through Go Engineer to Sci Solutions prior to that. Um, but uh, today I'm actually here kind of presenting my, uh, my side gig, um, which is uh, custom electric guitars in case it's not obvious. Um, the, uh, the user group asked me to, uh, to put on an advanced surfacing presentation and my, my kind of response was, you know, like, hey, I haven't really fired up SolidWorks for a living in like probably seven or 10 years now. Because <laughs> um, most of what I turn on, I'm modeling a quick, you know, model for PDM or data management, PLM stuff. but. Uh, I kind of moonlight at this stuff as well. I've got my own commercial license of SolidWorks as well as my own CAM software. Um, everything that you see in the room here from a guitar standpoint is not only modeled in SolidWorks, uh, it's, it's all of its CAMs done inside of the SolidWorks interface. Code gets generated right to a CNC machine at my house, right? So my work from home when COVID broke out was music to my ears, right? I've got a 900 square foot garage with 3D printers, laser cutters, you know, 3D uh, CNC machine. I've got three axis milling at, uh, at my house. And uh, I design and build uh, these when I'm supposed to be sleeping for the most part. Um, it slowed down a bit over the last number of years, having a family and a daughter that would do that to you. Prior to that, I was building pretty regular. But uh, I sold a number of custom one-offs over the years, got a product line uh, off the ground, and kind of slowed things back as, as my job is to manage most of my time. Uh, but the user group kind of pushed back on, on the advanced surfacing, um, you know, topic in that uh, they, they wanted to kind of pair it up with my prior presentation. We just did a uh, presentation on um, how we've taken all of the instruments and put them into DriveWorks for a configuration, sales configurator. So I do not, but am I a little too quiet? Right. Sure, can do. Gotcha. Thank you. So uh, I'll yell at you guys in the front then. Uh, but uh, so uh, they, you know, they kind of pushed back wanting uh, to see, um, you know, some of the CAD modeling I've done with some of these these uh, surface works and, and some of the guitars. I don't know that I'll claim it's advanced surfacing work, hence the title. Uh, I'm glad to dive into any surfacing topic with you that you got. Um, what I do with my guitar models is uh, more of what I would consider to be a hybrid modeling technique. So I start with a solid. Uh, in a lot of cases, I'll decompose that to a surface body and then restitch things back together again, right? And, and I do that because, one, I'm just really familiar with, with the solid modeling, right? Everybody draws box holes in it, right? And two, I really think it aligns really well with the manufacturing process, right? I don't want to, like, stitch some surface or something higher than the block of wood that I'm starting with, right? 
right? My raw stock is really, you know, my, my beacon as I'm doing design work, right? As such, you know, I have templates that are laid out for where the origin is every single time on the models, what the raw block and material is that I'm starting with. And then I start with kind of just a raw sketch off of what I'm going with. It's, um, it's very almost industrial design before it becomes CAD in many ways, right? Like my customers will literally be drunk at the bar giving me a bar napkin sketch. Like I'd like one of these, right? <laughs> and I have to go turn that into a CAD model tomorrow, right? And that, that really is the funnest part of it, right? Every guitar you see in front of you started as a sketch uh, on a napkin or something somewhere, like we'll post it, we'll like whatever it might be. And, um, you know, taking that into CAD and fleshing it out into reality is, is really what got me into this to begin with. At, a, at the reseller level, I don't have any um, tangible, you know, touching of the software, no product to build, which is why I, I, I uh, still consider myself a customer and a reseller in, in, in all regards. You know, so I'm here from kind of that light tonight. Um, I want to start off with some surfacing basics, and I know it's called advanced surfacing, but um, I want to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page about some of this hybrid modeling technique I'm going to show you, because I'm going to dive into some pretty hellacious feature trees here in a minute and show you how I stitch some of this stuff together. But I want to make sure everybody's on the same page about um, you know kind of how like hybrid modeling works as a whole. So um, I always tell customers as I'm as I'm showing them uh, something in, in SolidWorks is you'll be surprised what you can uh, what you can learn from a block with a hole in it, right? I'm going to number pads off. So as you extrude a solid into SolidWorks, uh, a ton of things actually happen in the background, right? Early modeling packages were either primitive based where it was giving you these solid shapes as you picked rectangle, cube, you know, cylinder, right? Or um, they are actually stitching together all these models on the back end. So what it actually takes to build the cube on the screen is a back surface, a set of extruded surfaces on the side, a surface on the front that moves with the extrusion depth, and then that stitches together into a, into a solid body, right? At any given time, you can decompose a solid into a surface body. And the fastest way to do that is a right click and then go to this face area and there's a delete face in here, right? I'm basically wiping out one of the faces on the solid model. And after you do that, you've got the option to delete and patch, delete and fill, or just delete altogether, right? When you do a delete face and a delete, you've now decomposed this model down from a solid into a surface, right? specifically one surface body, right? The remaining geometry on the screen is one body as, as it moves forward. Now, stitching this back together again can be done literally hundreds of different ways, right? I can, you know, sketch on the surface again. I can, you know, copy prior surfaces and restitch. I can replace face. I can do all sorts of different cut operations to do that. One of the fastest ones, you know, for something planar is going to be the planar surface where you just grab a couple of faces here and it will stitch a surface back across filling the hole that you deleted back out right now that by itself didn't make a solid again right that's now two separate surface bodies on the screen right there's a couple of ways to stitch this back into a solid as well um, knit surface is one of the quicker ones you pick a couple of surface bodies and then over on your left there's a create solid checkbox and then green check and now I've successfully stitched that back into a cube again, right? And I bring this up in advanced surfacing because you have to understand the basics before you get into advanced, right? Like ultimately that core premise is a lot of what I'm about to show you, right? I start with a solid body. I'm gonna hack and slash this thing into surfaces and then ultimately stitch it all back together again into a solid. Does your product need to be a solid when you're done? Absolutely not, right? I would highly recommend it if possible though. Right? If you're trying to injection mold this thing, it's going to need to be solid to get volumes right? and, and, and take on injection molding uh, capabilities. Um, in my case, I can technically cut to surfaces. Most cam tools are going off of faces on a model anyways. So like, ultimately, you can leave a series of surfaces if you want to. But I've had countless customers come to me over the years and ask me why this model is slow to open and it's a decomposed surface. SolidWorks is designed, hence the name, to be a solid modeling tool, and it has very good surfacing capabilities, but the way it stores data in the Parasolid modeling kernel is much more efficient when you have a solid on the screen. 
So what you'll find is if you download some model off the internet that's got a bad you know, face on it or something and it decomposes to a surface, it's gonna be tremendously larger than the equivalent solid, right? Um, so much so to the point where I've had it really bogged down assemblies. And if you have a bad face from a downloaded import, it can cause instability in the software, crashing of all kinds. I've had tons of customers call me like, we have a random crash. And I'm like, cool, it's a computer. There's really no such thing as random, right? We just have to figure out what is causing this. And more often than not, it's some imported surface body off of the internet, right? Like MasterCard and other places have these incredibly complex models now, and they don't always translate well. So, um, you know, watch that as you move forward. So that's kind of the raw basics behind that. Um, and like I said, there's a ton of different, you know, techniques that you can use as, as you go into this. Um, to really define hybrid modeling, um, it's when you are jumping back and forth between a solid and a surface by deleting or trimming faces back off and then restitching things back together as a solid, right? Uh, what I would call, I guess, pure surfacing is a lot more like what uh, body and white guys will do with, uh, you know, car outer body, right? They don't ever really stitch the car into a solid and when they're, when they're laying out body and white. They're going to take, you know, sweeping curves, trim everything, and get the car layout the way they want for flow and looks, right? And that might never, ever make it to a solid, right? It becomes a clay model. It becomes a mold or a die for whatever it needs to be. You know, so ultimately, it's, you know, a means to an end for what you're trying to do. So I was going to showcase a few different models here today, um, and particularly the guitar, you know, bodies that I've, I've designed over the years here. And I've got uh, everything downloaded over here. Um, I'll start with what I would consider to be some of the simpler stuff. Um, so the element is uh, effectively what I consider to be my simplest guitar model. And forgive the 75 volts that might pop up as I get up here. Um, you know, this particular model is uh, what I would consider to be a pretty simple feature tree. All things considered, you know, it's got, I don't know, maybe 50 features or something in it as I've moved into this. Um, and one thing I want to put a big disclaimer out in is I am not here to show you, uh, you know, good modeling techniques necessarily, right? Um, this is raw product development, right? So there's going to be dirty geometry in here that I hack and slash together from other products and parts of the neck brought into the body, right? Because I was just figuring out what I wanted the shape to look like. If I already knew what I wanted the shape to be, I would model this very differently, right? So just a disclaimer as you, as you look at what you're about to see here, right? Um, you know, so if I roll back in the tree on, on uh, something like this, as I mentioned, I'm starting with just a raw, simple solid, right? Um, that is gonna, you know, be designed within the constraints of my physical geometries. So here I've got a um, you know, overall framework for what you know, the solid body is going to be. I've got a common origin, right, that I've used on all the cars. And then um, here, you can see this thing's got a couple of horns that aren't on the final product. And that's really product share, right? So what I've done here is I went back to the original sketch of the Save As for another guitar I designed. And then I went in and just put a couple of splines in here and made the rest of the geometry construction so I could effectively use the rest of what I had before, right? Um, down below here, all of this geometry is all defined out you know, to all of the radius dimensions. And I've got effectively C1 continuity here, right? Everything's at least tangent, right? One really important fundamental with respect to um, surfacing in general is you need to understand the premise of curvature continuity, right? So discontinuous is two lines or surfaces that do not touch, right? A C0 is two lines that touch but are not tangent, so coincident. C1 is going to be tangent continuity, and then C2 is going to be a curvature continuous geometry, right? So as I come up into this spline geometry across here, I'm tangent coming out of here, but I'm also curvature continuous, so the rate of curvature is changing at the same angle that it's coming in at here. And you'll, you've seen curvature continuity integrated to your life tremendously over the last 10 or 15 years, right? Look at cars from the 60s, right? C0, everything was sharp corners. I personally liked it better back then, but ultimately, you know, they had C0 continuity in many cases. You see the, the start of C1 tangent continuity into the 
90s, you know, really the 2000s kind of started that. And now you look at like the new Mustang, the new Camaro, they've gone back to the old designs and really put C2 curvature continuity into those. It makes it a super streamlined look with the old aggressive style, which, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and ultimately, I didn't realize how important this was until I started to build the cars. When I started, there were things I wasn't even getting tangent, right? And it's important to understand as you go out to a CNC machine, uh, what the CAM software does with that. You know, if it's told to go from this point to this point in the perfect arc, it is going to momentarily pause at these points as it does so. So you will literally see the machine come around in its code and then kind of stutter through all the tangent points. Well, why is that important? Well, that momentary pause that that CNC machine does leaves a witness line on the final product. So if you're talking about a mold of any kind, the final product, in my case, is CNC cutting the wood, it's going to leave a line that's going to show up in paint. It's going to show up in the final product if that's in the mold, right? So now somebody has to go sand that out or defer that edge within the mold, which is causing manual operation, right? My first set of guitars, I spent hours sanding, right? Then I decided, hey, I'm going to way better off making this smoother in the CAD model, right? <laughs> and I'll wait for the machine to do its job, right? So now I got this machine doing most of my work, and I didn't get a chance to bring one of my raw products just due to humidity, uh, you know, difference between my shop and the rest of the world at this point. Winter's a tough time on guitars. Um, but ultimately, I've got this thing down to where I basically barely have to touch this in 220 sandpaper when I'm done to get the final product. And it takes tremendously longer to cut, but it's really important to understand the, the value of taking the time to make these things curvature continuous whenever possible, at least tangent or what you're looking for. So it starts with a really simple sketch, right? Um, and that gives me my raw body style. This one's got, you know, obviously some oats to, to uh, Les Paul in it, right? And you'll see all of my influences throughout the instruments. Um, the next thing that I did is completely unnecessary and has made this very difficult to manufacture. But it is something I felt needed to be done. And if there's any guitar people in the crowd, you'll understand why it had to be done. Um, ultimately, I needed to curve the top side of the guitar have some kind of arch to it with respect to the final product. And this is just something that Les Paul instilled in me at a young age for what products are supposed to look like, right? Um, the reason this caused such grief is I have to flip this thing over when I'm machining, right? And now I don't have a flat surface to hold it on. So this has also caused a whole bunch of need for fixturing, right? So what I'll show you is not only the surfacing work for the guitar itself, but then the reverse negative fixture that I need to hold it in the CNC machine as I vacuum this thing down. Because there are no screws, there are no clamps that hold this thing to my machine. It is all completely fastenerless. I stomp on a pedal, it sucks down to an origin and rips through this material. Okay. Um, the other reason that, that, that curvature continuity is so important is because I need this machine moving incredibly fast. Right? I'm ripping across this surface at 400 inches a minute with a, with a spindle that's spinning at 18,000 RPM. And to be able to go over a curved surface like this with a machine, I have to step over at a very light rate to get this smooth when I'm done, right? That step over on this machine is like five thousandths of an inch or something, right? So if you think about how much that half-inch ball cutter has got to walk across the surface, it's miles of travel that this machine has to do, right? And that's why I've pushed the machine as far as I have and the curvature continuity as much as I can. So that initial cut across the top surface here, super simple. All I've done there is draw a sketch of a line coincident to the top of the flat part of the guitar. There's another line down here that is the center line, and then I revolve the surface over the top of that, right? That gave me my arch top. And then I use a really simple command here called surface cut. So this surface cut here is just capturing that revolved surface that I put here, removing the top side of the guitar, and that crowns the top of the instrument. I'm gonna end up doing the same thing on my fretboards downstream, the back side of the neck, right? Um, and those end up being some wafted surfaces and other means. Then the rest of this just became a bit more extrusion cuts and things. You'll see um, kind of a pairing of a few different geometry, you know, changes that occur here. I went through a very significant model change um, about halfway through production, where I had all of this cut away and as part of the geometry into the neck. And I determined one uh, morning, it's actually Christmas morning, I woke up about two hours before the kids did, and 
I have an epiphany that all that geometry needs to be as part of the body for this to go better. Um, so I went in and effectively packaged the lash of the thing together. So what you see in the tree now is a, is a neck I brought into the guitar body and then I steal a bunch of geometry off of that because it took me days to figure out how to draw the neck and I didn't want to do that again, right? And like I mentioned earlier, you'll want to, you know, model in a different way if possible, right? Um, so just a couple of fillets on the outside. I cut away um, the geometries that I was looking for here, but one important thing I wanted to showcase here is I am doing the surface offset, stealing the geometry of the neck, right? So I've got that put into place, they match origin, and I'm taking that geometry from the neck file by means of, of what's called a surface offset. And the surface offset I wanted was zero, right? I'm just trying to copy that surface, right? But you'll probably find that SolidWorks doesn't actually have a copy surface command anymore. It's an offset of zero. There used to be a separate command for copy, and they've done away with that now. You can also use nits if you're only grabbing a couple of faces and not trying to stitch things together. But effectively, I'm trying to get you know bits of that geometry you know together into the model. Um, this is super useful when you're doing fixturing on things, right? You're going to bring in your product into what you're trying to fixture, and then surface offset of zero or some small value, right? Things in the real world don't fit together one to one, right? So the fixture I'll show you later is the guitar completely offset by like five thousandths of an inch. And that's enough to get it to fit perfect into the fixture without much margin of error. Um, I give myself five thou because if it rains outside, it moves more than that, right? So I got to stand to fit, you know, relative. You know, if you're working with a more stable material like aluminum or steel, you can get a little bit closer on your tolerance to that. Right? So as I come down here, um, Another really powerful command that I use all the time is a tool called untrim. So the bottom of this surface did not look the way that I wanted it to, right? And this untrim surface brings it back to its original kind of form in each square, right? So you can take any weird surface and just say untrim and click on the face, and it will bring it back to a raw square. And then you've got options to increase the percentage size to blow that surface up. Yeah. Right? No, that's true. Not any surface. Planar works very well. Um, you know, more generative curves. You know, definitely if you've got some crazy curvature change, it gets pretty ugly as it goes. Um, but that's pretty handy for getting things kind of squared off as you start to, to work on some surface stuff. And then uh, there's a checkbox in there for merge with original. Um, if you do not check that, it will make a copy of the surface with its extensions as opposed to altering the original. And there's times for both depending on what you're doing. Um, yep, definitely a good tip. Um, I don't know what it is, but sometimes the merge fails. And then yeah, if you want to check that box, you can usually get the raw geometry that you're looking for. Um, surface extend will be one of your best friends and worst enemies when you are surfacing. Um, it is very powerful, and, and why is it important? You don't ever want to take two surfaces and just have them really touch one another, right? At any given point, if there's even a fraction of a gap, it will fail to stitch back together again. So generally speaking, you want to overshoot your surfaces and then use trim operations to get back to the sharp corners that you want, right? And that's where extend is going to come into play. Uh, and then, like I said, it's going to be one of your best friends when you get into surfacing. Where it's your worst enemy is you can't surface extend on multiple bodies at a time. <laughs> so you have to have a bunch of these in your tree, depending on how many surface bodies you have. And then there's just points where you're grabbing edges along the way, and then it just the preview fails and it doesn't work, right? So you have to kind of battle with the edges and where they're, you know, they're coming from. It's especially troublesome on uh, imported geometry. I had a contract job I did once for a mold. I bid like probably 10 hours on building this mold. I got into it and all of the faces were shattered. When I went to go down and do the extend on it, I spent probably eight hours getting the surface extends to work on this thing. Then I had to build the rest of the mold to start with because nobody spent the time to make a curvature continuous to begin with. Right? And I didn't make that mistake anymore. I always interrogated models after that. So uh, you're going to use a series of trims and offsets to, to, to pull off whatever you want. Um, I've got uh, surface fill that I've done here, and that one's not shown. And then I'm doing some ruled surfacing and things inside of here as well. So effectively what I'm building back out is the pocket in which the neck is going to sit as I'm building this back together. 
together again. And then trimming that back up. And really some of the ugliness of stitching this back together. Um, to get this all curvature continuous inside of here, um, I'm patching in all sorts of different pieces of this as I go. Right? Um, one of these is done as a surface loft. And this is what I would consider to be a pretty simple loft. Right? I'm coming from just the curve here and just the curve here and it's taking that geometry across point to point on those connectors. Uh, a couple of things I'll point out here. If you just select this curve and this curve, you're not going to get this preview. You're going to get this. Right? It's going to come across in just that area. One of the very useful things that you can do in this selection process is right click and go to something called selection Selection Manager effectively says, hold off putting what I pick into that box until I tell you to, right? And you can go and pick all the edges that you want and say, send that into the box for my selection, right? And you do that again, and now you can get long series of curves that you can walk together, right? Um, prior to figuring this out, I've done all sorts of convert geometries and 3D sketching and stuff, and this is very powerful and handy when you're doing any kind of loft, both solid and uh, surface. Uh, as well as any sweep commands, right? The path and sweep, you're going to probably use this tool as well. And there's no button anywhere in the software for it. It is a right click only, as far as I know. I don't think they have an icon anywhere for the selection manager. Uh, so, really, really handy tool there. Uh, again, I do some delete face work, you know, and wipe some of the other geometry back off the back uh, so I can clean some things out. And then I did this monstrosity. This took a very long time to figure out how to get this to rebuild correctly and not throw errors. Uh, but this is really one of the things that drove me into uh, guitar was the neck and body joint on, on guitars on the market has bothered me for a very long time. Most of the guitars on the market have a bolt-on neck. As you slide up the neck, you just run with this brick on the back of the guitar. And then you have to come over the top of the instrument to play the high frets. Um, I was determined to solve that problem. So what I've done here is basically carve out all the geometry on the back and then loft in a surface from this 3D curve up to this parabola. And the reason this became a parabola is I'm going through a variable radius at an angle, right? So I've got a plane set up that's coming through the neck here down at an angle and then I'm lofting from there to there to get that geometry. And the result is something that your palm fits into the back of now. So I can palm this guitar all the way up to the 24th fret without having to raise over the top of it. All right? And that's really what I was setting out to do. I've since altered that geometry since, and it's been uh, a labor of love for a long time. I've talked to many, many luthiers, and the neck and body joint is what keeps them up at night and keeps coming back for more on this. Because the way you join this together is, is effectively is the build of an instrument. Uh, this was a redesign that made light into all of the instruments that I've uh, built since. Uh, and believe it or not, these crazy sharp corners hold up on the CNC machine if you're really, really careful. <laughs> so I end up dropping a half inch ball mill in here and then walking it out one way, not back around because you'll blow the corner back out. Uh, but I can leave like that parabola off of the edge of this thing. And the end result ends up with this V-shape that I can just drop in. I put glue in here and put one clamp across that comes together and today none of them have come back apart so I think I'm doing all right so the uh, the next uh, trick I'll show you here um, and I'll show you that loft but it's it's basically the same animal um, this one had a, a bit more um, going on so this is the same premise I showed on the front side of that guitar with two curves right I use selection manager to grab my 3d curve off the back of the guitar and then the parabola was its own sketch, so I didn't need to use selection manager for that. Where this got very complicated was these pink curves on the outside. Right? I needed the eye curves to drive what I wanted this thing to look like so it fit into the human hand pattern. Right? And this is uh, nearly an art form, in my opinion. If you're trying to do something ergonomic that fits into somebody's hand, it's incredibly difficult to see in a computer. So what I ended up doing happen to have a quarter million dollars worth of 3D printers that Joe had around. So I just cut a cross section to this thing and sent it to a printer a bunch of times until I got the shape that I was looking for and iteratively solved what I wanted to pick. Right? Uh, you can do the same with some very low-end printers in your house now, which is great. Um, 
So here I'm basically using these outer curves as guide curves within that geometry set, right? So that surface loft is a combination of things, right? I'm coming from this surface out to this. I'm coming into this, just C1, I couldn't do C2. Every time I tried to come in, uh, or C0 rather, every time I tried to come in tangent, um, it really screwed up this curve. So I ended up just going down to uh, just coincident out here, and I do still stand to that part of the joint. Uh, but ultimately, I've got, you can kind of see in the preview here, this almost knife edge that comes up inside of this thing. And it ended up, um, I really liked the way it felt in the hand and looked in general, um, but really what sold me on it was FEA analysis. So you can't run a really accurate study on wood. So I forego the idea that there's grain involved and just said, well, what's my factor of safety in steel for this thing, right? Um, a lot of people don't realize it. The guitar with its strings in full tune is putting like 200 pounds of pressure on this neck trying to fold this thing in half all the time. And it gets tremendously worse when it gets dropped on the concrete floor at band practice. So I've seen some horrible, horrible things happen to guitars at band practice. And one of the things that I noticed was they break in one of two places, particularly right here in the back of the headstock and right down here at the neck and body joint, right? So I redesigned this, merged the two together, assuming the glue joint is stronger than the wood, and ran FEA analysis compared to a bolt-on design and increased the factor of safety 14-fold on this thing. And I have not been able to break this in any way, not to smash it on the ground yet. Um, but ultimately, it's been holding up very well. And on the neck, I'll open, I'll show you what I did at the back of the headstock on something called the glute to strengthen the, the weak area up there as well. And it's all done through packet slash surface being inside solid works. So with a surface loft, you just need the two different curves. Uh, but to really shape what you're looking for, you might need some extra curves on the outside for your guides, right? In this case, they're three splines, and they are just two-point splines, right? So what I mean by two-point spline is you're literally just picking this point and this point, right? And that's going to look like a straight line when you draw it. When you click on the spline, you're going to get guide curves. And as you pull on those, you can, in 2D or 3D, pull these to where you want to go. And I've literally just eyeballed these things till they matched what I wanted, right? Um, if you're trying to hit hard numbers, you can dimension them in space as well, right? But for my purposes, it was more about the feel than it was the number, right? And that's how I built something like that. The next thing down here that I want to discuss is boundary surface. So boundary surface is similar to loft, but actually even more powerful. So a boundary surface, you'll notice, has direction one and direction two. Two curves, right? The last screen I had up on the loft has effectively what are you lofting, what are the guide curves, right? And this looks very similar, but the difference being uh, here, you can control your curvature concretely per side of this thing, right? So on the loft, the start and end of the loft, let's say this and this were my loft edges, I can control curvature continuity between here and here, and that's it. I can't do anything with the guide curve on the loft. I'm just C0, right? On a boundary surface, you get control over the curvature continuity on all four sides of this thing, right? Which now means as you're patching a surface, you can get C1, C2 continuity in multiple directions as you go, right? So it's my opinion whenever you're trying to accomplish that, the first thing I'm going to attempt is a boundary. If I can get boundary to work, it's generally going to result in the best surface that I can get for my curvature continuity guide. If I can't get that to work for some reason, I'll resort back to lofting, and then I'm foregoing one of the curvature continuity points on the model, right? And at some point, you can battle this, or you can, you know, give in and let it, you know, not be curvature continuous, right? <laughs> ultimately, it's about how much time you want to spend versus your final product, right? Um, I found, you know, 220 sandpaper goes a long way, so I don't battle with it too long anymore, but... Um, so I basically did a lofted surface on this side, another boundary on this side rather, and then I stitched the entire thing together using that surface knit command I showed in the cues early on. Right? So I took a series of those surface bodies, joined them together back into a solid in the tree. And one of the things that I'll point out here is you'll notice here now it's got two solids, the neck's also in there. There's a couple of miscellaneous surfaces, but I've got the surface and solid bodies folder turned on in my feature tree all the time. Right? As a hybrid modeler, 
I don't want those turning off ever. I want to know exactly how many solids and surfaces I have going on at any given time. That's under Tools, Options, Feature Manager. And then there's some settings down here that control what these things are turned on or off. Solid bodies and surface bodies are set to automatic inside SolidWorks by default. Automatic actually has two different meanings for a solid or a surface. And automatic for solid means when there is more than one solid, show the folder. When there's only one solid or less, make it disappear. For surfaces, automatic means when there's at least one surface, show the folder, right? Uh, my personal preference for any hybrid modeling, I just set these to show all the time. And now this thing is going to be on constantly within the tree, whether or not there's bodies in there. And it gives me a count, so I know exactly what I'm looking at as I'm working. This becomes hugely important as you have a bunch of complex tool bodies going on and different things embedded into your assembly, right? Um, so if you look here, before that surface stitch, right, that tree is at now nine surface bodies, right? Three of them were some construction geometry I was using, and then the one solid is just the neck. After I did that knit, I stitched six of those together into a solid, leaving me with three and two. You know, and then you can always go in here and kind of highlight over the top of what it's called. One kind of nice but super annoying thing, SolidWorks bodies like to appear at the last feature that was worked on from them, right? Uh, where that's kind of nice so you can remember where you're at. It's super annoying when you're trying to export tooling bodies and things like that because it's called hole one or tap this, right? So you can rename your bodies by F2 on the keyboard and name whatever you'd like as well. The rest of this model, uh, for the most part, was a bunch of manual features, right? There's nothing particularly special about the machining pockets for the electronics, right? Um, I'm going in with a quarter inch angle cutting these things now. I gotta go a little bit deeper on the sides here uh, because the screw adjustment for the humbuckers gets a little deep. And then uh, these have to be incredibly accurate. The bridge location sets literally the tone of the entire guitar, right? Or the intonation of the guitar. So the distance between the bridge and the 12th fret and the 12th fret and the nut has to be exactly the same on a guitar. If it is not, you didn't build a guitar. You built a block of wood with strings on it, right? This thing has to be in perfect intonation because as you pluck an open chord, right, that's going to be, let's say, E in this case, this needs to repeat that at the 12th fret for the octave on the guitar. And the guitar has a twin octave, right, where a piano has more than that as it goes. And if you miss that, Literally every note on the instrument is off after that. So the setting of that is incredibly imperative to the build of the guitar. So the rest of this model and, and, and many of them became a matter of ergonomics again, right? I like the way that the hand felt on this thing, but I did not like the way this body sat against me. Um, ultimately, um, I play the guitar sitting down or standing up, and what I found is most guitar makers aren't taking the time to make the back of this thing ergonomic rib cage as you're playing. So I set out to get curvature and continuity that matched my body curve on the back side of the instrument. And this got a little involved. Um, so I came up with a methodology called a split line here. So I've drawn uh, a spline on the back side of this model. And then I used a command called split line in SolidWorks to break up the space into two different faces. So pretty simple command, all things considered. You literally are drawing a sketch on here. I make the curve however I want. It's coincident on either end to a couple of points here. I get the curve looking about where I want it to be. And then when you go to split, you are telling it what surfaces are going to get split into two faces as the time goes. Now this doesn't decompose it into a surface model, but what it does is it prepares the model to be decomposed into a surface model. And what I mean by that is, this is the area I'm going to get rid of, right? This is what I want that curve to, to kind of match up to my body, but then I want to take down the rest of this geometry further away from me so it sits better on me. So I did a couple of those and split out the geometry across this edge down here was my second one. I uh, basically splitting this up because my end goal was to effectively destroy all these fillings and work my way back into the model. So then I did a delete face across that, decomposing the model and wiping out all of that geometry, and then stitched it all back together again with 
boundary surface. So boundary surface here again is allowing me to do multiple cur curvature continuities. So using the selection manager, I've grabbed all of these edges, all of these edges, walked it across there, curvature continuous to either end of this, and I've got this smooth flowing curve across the entire back of the instrument now. Um, I've played with a couple of varieties of this. I've done uh, cross sections through the middle of this to control exactly what this looks like in some cases, and I can use those as guide curves that can drive wherever I want within the model. Okay. In this particular case, I liked what everything looked like as, as tangent, so I just ran with that. And then it might be hard to see on the projector, but I've effectively taken this multiple generative curves now and molded a perfectly tangent surface along the back side of that instrument, wrapped into the front fillet now and back out again, right? So I'm effectively C0, C1 here, up to C2, up to, or up to C1, up to C2 around the corner and flushing it, right? And the end result, looks like this in paint. So as I hold that up, you may or may not be able to see it from back there, but it's a completely smooth transition up into the guitar body itself and sits up against the body a lot nicer now. I don't have this sharp edge or what it was like a half inch radius or something riding up against the body, right? And a typical gig back when I played out live was going to be two to three hours at night, right? So this thing's an albatross around your neck by the end of the night. So I'm trying to make it as comfortable as I possibly can. And guitar players in general are super picky about what their guitar feels like. Like it looks like is one thing, but it has to feel a certain way, right? So I've done tons of surfacing work on the backside of the neck as well to control that. But that's kind of the basics on this model. Um, there's more of the same on uh, a lot of the different guitar designs, but I'll show you some of the more you know complex ones here as we move forward. The neck itself has been its own design and challenge over the years, and I'll jump into that. So from a few feet away, this thing looks pretty straightforward. It's a rectangle with a headstock on it, right? But ultimately, this, uh, this ends up being a pretty complex bit of geometry for a couple of reasons. Um, one, this surface is flat but not horizontal to the XYZ plane. Right? Um, this is back tapered on my guitar about three degrees. And that came from Les Paul. Um, effectively, Fender has a, a, a flat neck, uh, and then they are offsetting the fretboard relative to their bolt-on, where um, Les Paul did a set neck. Uh, and to combat the pressures of the strings, he put a three degree back taper on the neck, so as this thing pulls on it, it's pulling the guitar back to square, right? That 200 pounds of force brings the wood back up in the square so that none of the frets bites. My guitars are actually a combo of the two. So uh, a Gibson is a 24 and three quarter scale on a three degree back pitch. A Fender is a 25 and a half scale on a flat. My guitars are a 25 and a half inch scale on the three degree back angle, which has made fixed string and cutting this thing all sorts of fun. <laughs> but, Ultimately, that ends up being flat, but it is a tapering edge, right? So a guitar neck is narrower at the top than it is at the bottom, which is more pronounced on a bass that would get wider for the diameter of the strings, right? So uh, it's rather hard to see from a distance uh, in, in, in the, um, the string set. But then on top of that, the back side of this thing is really where all the surfacing gets done, right? So back here, I've got what appears to just be a radial surface off the back of this, but it's anything but. Um, they, the industry describes these things as kind of like D-shaped or V-shaped, and it's all about that loft on the back side of this, right? Um, I not only do a variable radius curve on the back of the neck, I have a variable radius curve on the fretboard as well. So not only is this surface contoured to the hand, the reason I radius the top side of this thing has to do with playability. If you leave a super flat surface up there, you're going to struggle to bend notes to pitch shift as you're playing. But it's really nice for playing chords. It's much easier to, to fret over multiple things as you're pushing down. So some guitars like flat fretboard, some like a bent fretboard, depending on their style. What I've done is actually variable this from here to here 
and here to here again on the fretboard. So I have a flatter top of the guitar with the curvature, and then it rounds out as it goes down. Because you're typically going to bend notes on the high side of the guitar where it's now more curved, and you're going to play chords up at the top where you're going to get more of that flat geometry. All of that's done through a surface curve loft, right? So if I go look kind of back at that um, here, tree, and there may be some really ugly geometries here, but I've even got like original features. You can see here I've resorted to just stuffing all of my dirty laundry in the folders in the feature tree as I went, right? Um, and then down through here, that's the original loft. So fairly straightforward, but I made a very complex shape to manufacture in a very quick order. Right? Um, it's basically just a curve up at the top, a curve at the bottom that's driven by a couple of dimensions, right? The width of the nut is, is a variable if you're a user of the hands or a guitar build, and then this radius is driven by the thickness that they want it to be up here, right? Same thing goes for the bottom of the neck with the taper that goes out. And then that's just a surface loft between those two geometries. And then again, I got this down to just a D shape that fits into the back of the neck. Uh, the other thing I'd like to show with respect to the neck itself is going to be this feature here called the volute. Let's see where it's at here. So um, I mentioned earlier I was doing some strength tests on things. And this is the number one failure mode of a guitar falling over. Right? I watched it horror one night as a $3,000 Les Paul. Somebody tripped on the cable and it went face down onto the concrete. And all of that force transfers right here, right? And then all of the strength of those strings pull on it and it literally blows the back of the neck out right here at this joint. It's separating wood grain this way when it happens. Um, so I made sure as I went into this design, I wanted to make sure this is the strongest point that, that I, could, I could make it. Now, unfortunately, that's right where the truss rod comes through weakening that area, which is why it breaks there, right? So there's a rod up the middle of the guitar called the truss rod, and this is actually able to crown the guitar fretboard so that it can effectively get shaped by the luthier to build it into a playable instrument. Because while this thing may start flat, by the time you put frets into it with a hammer, and then you put 200 pounds of force on pulling on it, it will actually bow the neck and there's going to be an Allen key that comes in here to adjust that to put the bow back to where you want it to go. That greatly weakens this area of the neck. So what I ended up doing was a pretty simple solution here. This particular feature uh, is just, I cut out the bad section again, where I wanted to get rid of the weak geometries, right? And that was literally just a surface trim here and here to pack that out. And then I did a loft between three profiles here, instead of just going from one to the other. I wanted to get something in the middle that drew up strength. And this actually serves two purposes. This is not an original idea. This came from Italy, I think, originally, hence the name. Uh, but the idea has been in there for a while. But because of where the headstock lands, it's always been a rather useless feature aside from strength. What I did was I strategically landed the headstock to the nut to where the bridge is, so that as your hand slides up the guitar, your thumb stops at the volute, bringing you back to the first fret every single time, indexing the instrument in the dark while you're drunk on stage. So <laughs> this, uh, this loft of curve was uh, what I was looking to do with that. So it came from the original geometry here up into the square that was the, the headstock area where the double fillet. And then I put in a curve in the middle of this to drive that uphill to get that sharp corner to occur. And there's a really tricky thing here that I want to make sure I share with you as um, as you attempt to do something like this. So you can kind of see here what it's doing, right? It came from a T shape to a square shape and then came uphill and back down again to get that strength into the model. And the challenge there is that I'm lofting from effectively a single curve here, right? This is just an arc, up to one, two, three, four, five-sided face over here. Anybody attempt to do this? 
it gets kind of hairy in a hurry, right? Like the nodes don't go in the right direction and you can't get symmetry very easily, right? So what's done to, to get around this is pretty slick trick. This sketch here just has effectively that one curve again here, but getting from point A to point B here, you can do something called split entities. So there's a command in the sketching tools in the software where you can pick a couple of points along a curve and it will break this curve up, leaving it intact, right? It all gets uh, co-radial or whatever it was to keep it fully defined, but will break up that sketch into points. And now you can effectively break this into as many segments as what you're trying to loft into. That's going to give you the control to go from one shape to another in a very discreet way, right? You can define exactly where those are along the curve by height or angle to wherever you want them and drive exactly what you want the shape to look like without having to eyeball all of the individual nodes all along the path. Okay. So that's uh, some of the volute in the back of this thing. And again, took a long time to get to that in general geometry. Um, the worst part about this is how much wood just gets utterly scrapped when I cut this thing. Right? Um, it's a shame, really. I think I did the math on it at one point, I'm throwing away like 60% of this exotic hardwood as soon as I bolt it to the machine. It's turning into sawdust to get this shape out of it. And that's down from closer to 80 because I've changed my manufacturing practice. The only way around it is to joint the top and to do what's called a sharp joint where this piece goes into this. Um, but I just feel pretty strongly that should be one piece of wood. So you know, it is what it is. Um, many different builders do a lot of different things with this neck headstock joint as well. So the element itself. Um, was not the first instrument that I made. Um, the one that I've spent the most time on early on was that guitar over there in natural finish called the Havoc. Uh, this was originally a Barnacky sketch from my time business partner that had a vision of what he wanted, uh, translated it to uh, you know paper, and then uh, I turned it into well at first an AutoCAD print and then into like SolidWorks 2001 Plus that's now made it 20 years into the future here and become a, uh, a full-on product uh, that I've now manufactured. There are currently four of those in the world: Alpha, Beta, and two serial numbers that I've made, uh, with more on the way. And uh, I spent a substantial amount of time with the evil looking horns on this thing to get them the way I wanted. Um, ultimately, I wanted a really sharp edge. I wanted something that, that looked dangerous to play and then have on stage. Um, but as you may be aware, a sharp corner doesn't bode too well in the real world, right? It breaks down and I'm gonna lose paint off of that edge and things as it gets rough. So what I ended up having to do here was a series of surfacing tricks to get all this to work. So it started life with chamfers, but the chamfers don't blend together because, of course, I crowned the top of this thing earlier and crowned the bottom of it, so now the chamfers are all over the place, right? So I had to get real creative on how I created a bunch of this stuff. And then to get rid of that virtual sharp, right, I ended up just destroying that uh, upper you know, sharp edge, and then I ripped it off between the two to get me down to something that was more curvature continuous across those two. And again, it's just more lofts and surface work in there. Um, where the really ugly part of this particular guitar came from is in this particular chamfer. To my knowledge, SolidWorks still doesn't have the capability to pull off a chamfer that diminishes to a sharp point on either end, right? So this thing is a, a live chamfer through the middle of it, but then I'm tapering this down to effectively a sharp point on either end of this thing in 3D, right? Because this is curving downhill as it matches into the curve of the body as it goes. And I did a number of different things to get that to work. And in particular, a command called replace face ended up being the, the easiest way forward in this. So kind of rolling back on the model. I'm now down to just the raw solid again. I've got the chamfers you know, largely there, but they're not shaped yet and things. And I tried everything I could think of to get this chamfer to work. It just kept blowing out the end of the model or not wanting to chamfer up corner and I abandoned, I abandoned um, the, the idea of doing this as a solid. Now in the meantime I had been building a series of surfaces within the geometries here. So there's a surface suite that goes along this curve 
So what I've done here is I drew this a line at a 45 degree angle, right? And then I'm using this curve to run a certain sweep command to get effectively this geometry as it matches the curvature around that 3D shape, right? Then I'm taking that and stitching it back together again with the solid body that was there because it didn't want to stitch back together again for me. And I did something called a replace face with the software. Anybody use this command yet? So a replace face is effectively, I have this series of surfaces and I want to swap them out with this other series of surfaces, right? So a uh, really simple example, if I had a uh, you know, cylinder, right, and I took some crazy weeping curve over the top of the cylinder, you could, instead of cutting with surface, use replace face to just swap the top of the cylinder out with a crazy curve, right? And I've done that at a mass level here with all these surfaces of these bodies to get this all to stitch back together into what I was looking for. Because without it, I was having trouble getting this all to knit back into a solid again even with C0 continuity. And it was particularly in this corner giving me problems because it's riding uphill into a sharp that way and diminishing to zero, right? Um, that diminishing to zero, by the way, um, is one of the most difficult things to deal with in surfacing, right? Whenever possible, try not to cause what this condition is. This is called a singularity on the surface. When it goes to a theoretical sharp point of no return, right? And if you try to loft from here out, you'll run into problems because lofts want a surface, an edge to go off of, right? You can loft from a point to an edge and attempt to whatever you want there, but you'll probably find challenges going to, to sharp vertices like this as, as a singularity. Um, and that's where I spent the majority of the time on this model trying to get that gnarly chamfer on the edge of the thing. And that was purely for looks. Like the original drawing was hand drawing had it, and it just had to be there, right? It was just something that we both wanted into the model. And I couldn't tell you the hours I had in figuring out how to turn that into a real life product. Um, machining it became actually very simple to do. Um, it just steps down with a deep cutter pack. So I step over the top of this with what's called an even different offset, where I'm taking on surface work off the top of the shallow curve. And then as I get to these edges, that starts to step over too far as it goes downhill, and I switch to the deep finish as I walk down the edge of that guitar. Uh, every guitar effectively has a rough pass, a equidistant step over, and a deep finish. And that's what finishes each side of the guitar as I flip it around into pictures. But, as always, I had to do something to outdo my last one. So, my business partner drew me what became affectionately known as the Inferno. This thing is a surfacing nightmare. I've had countless hours of my life into getting this shape, shape the way that I want. But what I set out to do, I think I accomplished, was to cut 3D flames into the surface of the guitar in generative form. Um, the only thing left on this that is remotely close to flat is the back right here, um, and that's about it. Everything else is a series of stitched surfaces across everywhere. Um, this is still that arch surface, but that's all that's left of the original arch that I cut onto the surface that I showed you earlier. And the rest of this became a conglomeration of cutting, stitching, lofting. Um, I did you know, some solids that I removed to get some of the flame work inside of the guitar here and ended up just being one of the ugliest feature trees for anything I've ever created. This thing is that long now. <laughs> I'm guessing somewhere around like 150 features or more. I guess I could use the feature analysis. It might tell me real quick. I think this gives me a count. Oh, 242 features to build this thing. <laughs> so uh, if I kind of roll back in the tree, you'll see some of my insanity here. Um, this thing, again, kind of started life as a bar napkin sketch. It started life pretty simply uh, originally, and then the hack and slash started. And I'm still way up here. So there's the original sketch. And way back in the tree, I started a surface sweep command that would become this flame cut in the top side of the guitar. We've kind of break that down. It's a sketch, 
here, that is the distance, and then an angled sketch to give me effectively a 45 degree taper plane from the inside of the sun. Right? Um, and I went this road, uh, particularly up front, because of all the battles I had with complex chamfering on the Havoc, right? I didn't want to get into that fight again with this thing, so I started like that surfacing at that level, right? And then rolling forward, did some surface extend work to get this thing out. A little bit more extension. Loft across here and eventually use that to trim. Knit, trim some more and surface cut to remove that notch. So this tiny little teardrop thing took you know, 10, 12 features of the tree to get the way I wanted it to look as I'm, as I'm moving through this. And it's kind of a combination of this drop surface, this surface, this little knife edge stuff in here that's causing a whole bunch of grief, right? Whenever you're offsetting a surface for a fixture, look for tiny little faces that you miss, because SolidWorks won't tell you about them. It'll just say air can't offset surface. Right? And it's usually something about that big or smaller that'll get you on that surface outside. Right? Uh, there's a number of these as I go through, and I do the same thing down here. This surfacing work, you know, was the same as a year. I started by getting the sketch over and cutting. Uh, unfortunately, the curvature of the guitar here and at the top are not identical, right? Because they are they're complicated, so it couldn't just be a mere surface. Uh, although if you can get symmetry, go ahead and do that. Um, I have a much more complex version of it down here. Where I'm, again, 45 angling surface sweeps across all of this. Uh, and then coming down here with additional extensions and things resulting in a surface cut that removed material back to there. And that got me a set of planes carved into this thing on a curved surface as I went. From there, I just kind of hammer through some more of this as I'm going through and doing the revolve cuts. I added fillets to things. Brought in that neck model again, and you'll see kind of repeat geometries there as I'm lofting across all of this. I thought about just stealing the geometry from the other models, but I came to the conclusion on it that I didn't really want all the context relationships of bringing in another guitar and stacking that on top of the next guitar. And pretty soon I was going to get myself to the point where modifying the first guitar broke four more, right? So I ended up just remodeling a lot of what you've already seen up there to get the neck geometries to come together again. And then, of course, I wanted to make it more complicated. Uh, it wasn't enough to just kind of have this little flame, so I wanted to scale up the sides of it again, right? And that came from the original scalloping that I did on the back to form the set of body. But now I've set off to do this twofold on the front edge of this thing as it collides with teardrop planes that I've already made on the model. And that's where many, many hours went into this. So here I ended up you know, doing the same um, kind of tricks to this line geometry that I'm using a foot line again here um, to break that up. And then stitching back together again the surface modeling here, boundary surface across more of these geometries to stitch everything back together again. Of course, one side gave me more problems than others. Boundary across all of that in a bunch of series of trims that got me down to this kind of smaller plane on the front surface of the guitar as it stitches back together again. Once I got it back to a solid, I set off to go and hack and slash the back of it some more, I think, was next. Uh, I fixed a bunch of stuff in there. And then I went off to doing some more delete face here. So I didn't like the way that this just came downhill. So I ended up hacking all of this out again, just using delete face to get rid of all the geometry I don't want, walking back into the existing fillets as it comes downhill there. And it's just more of a series of lofts. Um, I did one surface here I haven't showed you yet called a ruled surface. Um, this was just a super simple version of it. But um, a ruled surface is effectively taking an edge uh, or a series of edges, and then you can do a number of different things with them. So you've got tangent to surface, you've got normal to surface, you can taper to a vector, you can go perpendicular to a vector. 
So this is super useful for doing like interlocks and things. Like you think about a die mold, right? It's got a set in like for a, a mold, usually your tapered interlocks are like five degrees. You're gonna take the top edge of that thing and do a little surface up from that edge, to give you that standoff for the interlock on a mold. I'll do that off pretty often in tooling. Um, just a really fast way to take an edge and cast a surface off of that uh, to build out geometries there as well. There's some more 3D sketches and lofts to get this thing all stitched back together again. This comes down the model here. And then I think I took to the back of it and started to scallop back here and did kind of the same types of geometries here. This thing ends up actually going almost convex. curvature on the back just to see if I could. I wanted to thin this thing down and get that squared up and uh, that ended up being the end result. So after I get done surface modeling this thing because of my own work on me, I now have to fixture this and turn it into a real product, right? So taking this off to the fixture, now at least on this guitar, fairly simple. Ultimately, I'm not holding this side of this thing, right? I would never recommend building a fixture that complicated for anything. So you have to decide what side of the guitar you're going to cut first, right? I have to flip this thing over and refixture. So it starts life as a block of wood, and I cut what's called B-side of this. So B-side is the back where I'm cutting this out of raw stock everywhere. I rough everything out uh, as a surface, right? And I actually have to do more surfacing work there as well, right? So here on the model, I've already got electronics pockets and things cut off, right? I've got holes in the model. And I don't want the code to come up and go around the holes as it goes to cut this. I'm looking for all smooth surfacing again. So after I surface this entire thing and then blow holes in it, I have to patch the surfaces again to get the can product to go well. Right? And that can be a series of suppress, or what I'll often do is go copy the surfaces earlier on in the model to then bring forward after I start cutting holes through things so I have good solid can surfaces sheet right once i've got all of that i'll pull these off into the fixtures themselves i think i've got in here tooling let's take a look at the uh the havoc's probably the worst fixture so this is actually a raw block right then I'm taking the guitar as the first feature into this model, right? I'm a big fan of multi-body modeling. Um, I generally try to stay away from assembly due to in context references and things like that. I like to do most of my tooling work in a multi-body file. And then if we need an assembly when we're done, I do a save bodies to dump back out to install models and pen. Personal preference, there's ins and outs to both. But the first thing I do is, is insert a part into this part, right? And again, all the fixtures share the same origin Part, so everything lands exactly where it's supposed to and drops into the model. The feature tree on this is tremendously easier because I've done most of the hard work in the model itself, right? So I brought in the entire guitar, boss extrude that, and then I did that surface offset that I was talking about earlier. And this is a one-to-one -one offset here. I then go take that and bump it like four or five thousandths. You may find extreme difficulty in trying to offset your model, even a small amount, when it has tons of little faces. One of the most frustrating things about this is if one little face in the hundreds that you've selected fails to offset, the entire thing fails and solvers will not tell you which one it is. So what I've found myself doing is I'll go through and after I've picked about 15 faces, I'll hit the green check. Okay, that worked. Add a feature. Go back in. Pick some more. Right? And they keep hitting the green check, the, the pulse check, right? Because too many times I got to the end, thought I had them all, and then it doesn't work. And then you have to backtrack, and you guys will just start over. Right? So this ends up being a, a slight offset in the model geometry. And then I used uh, some, some kind of slick things here called a delete hold. Uh, anybody familiar with that command? There's no feature for it anywhere in SOLIDWORKS. It's a very hidden tool. Uh, and it's very, very cool. I'll show you a really quick rendition of it here. Did they finally put an icon in? For the longest time, it didn't even have an icon. So if I take, um, let's say, something like this, and I make a plane out of that, 
right? So obviously I drew the hole in there on purpose, right? But if this is the surface, I just want to clean up and I want to wash this out, right? Super fast and, and easy way to do this. Select the edge of the modeling tool that fitted by the Nikon. Um, the longest time I didn't have one, so it was very hard to discover. Select the edge of the model, just the edge, and hit the delete button on the keyboard. And it'll pop up with this super cool command called delete hole. And it is magic. You just say okay, and whatever you click on just disappears, right? And like you can do this on some really complicated things. Like I've done some gnarly molds where I'm like, I just need that not to exist. And grab all those edges and they just disappear. And again, obviously, you know, if you just a feature that you can suppress, go do that. But I use this all the time when somebody's sending me their models that I gotta make a mold out of and I wanna get rid of lifter pins and all sorts of stuff on the molding side of things. Really, really powerful command for cleaning things up. So I did some cleanup on that to get this patched. And then I had to extend that surface north of the top edge of the picture. So we can, uh, we can cut off of that remove all that geometry from there. Uh, and then I set to cleaning up this massive loft area up here. And I end up with some sharks that my CNC machine cannot get into. I made a really easy solution to that. There's no great big holes right here. All right, so now the fixture can fit it, it drops in and vacuums down. I'm getting the, uh, the flag to wrap it up here. So I'll roll to the end here. That cuts off all that surface geometry. The last thing in here is the vacuum pocket. So I've got a 3D pocket buried down inside of the 3D surface of this thing. It gives me a vacuum chamber. There's holes drilled through here in the vacuum on the bottom. And I run an eighth of an inch end mill around that whole thing to get the edge of the gasket, glue it on, and then stomp on a pedal. And the guitar body sucks down into that fixture to cut the ace off. And then rinse and repeat for every given body. So every guitar requires its own female fixture. And I bake that into the kind of pricing model, right? You want one of the ones I already have a fixture for, it's cheaper than if you want your own <laughs> sketch. Because <laughs> I've got to code and draw all of that along the way. So. Uh, surfacing wise, uh, just the body work, it was it was days, like on and off. Like they're like I don't sleep much, so I'll just go out and <laughs> hack and slash it at a guitar for dollars on end. Like I'm probably if I had to take a guess, like probably like 20, 30 hours into hacking and slashing on this thing. Um, and then I got to code it. I cut it. I don't like it. I do it again, right? Like it's it's, a, it's definitely a labor of love for sure. So um, I started pretty early on. I've got Bobcam Pro. Um, it's an add-in to SolidWorks. Um, a lot of people ask me why I didn't use SolidWorks Cam, and the answer was it didn't exist when I started uh, for one. And then for two, SOLIDWORKS CAM cannot cut the shapes I've shown you, right? Um, CAM works can, but you need three axis milling to do what I'm doing, right? Uh, you, you can't pull off, uh, you know, the surface cutting off of that, uh, especially uh, the step down, right? The Z-axis finish stuff is really more of a three, three axis mill thing. Um, and then I run Mach 3 on my controller at the house. Um, I've debated upgrading to Mach 4, but at this point, 3 is still written for me, so I use that for my control software. And my most recent addition is a 10 watt diode laser I bolted on the side of this thing. So now I can throw a toggle switch and it becomes a laser engraver as well. So the next thing you'll likely see from me is laser cut guitars and engraved guitars on the fretboard from the CAD models. And then I got to figure out all the code for that. So that's next. Uh, uh, um, my original vision was to just like live broadcast the guitars getting machined, and I do have webcam set up in there. Because when I hit go on this, I'm back in the house where it's warm while this thing cuts, right? Like, um, I keep the shop at like 60 degrees. Uh, I've debated it. Like, I, I um, every time I try something with social media, it gets a really strong following, and then I, I get super busy with other stuff and forget to upload things. And you can't keep a following unless you're constantly feeding social media. Right? And I, I come to the conclusion I need somebody like filming it. I've got a, I've got a, uh, a camera out in the shop to, to do some of what I'm doing when I work. It's just so much work to try to edit the video and stuff. Like my counterpart over here, Darren, is excellent at it. He's got amazing videos that he time lapses all sorts of stuff on. I took a stab at it this year with some epoxy work, and I got so just bored at staring at video. <laughs> I went back to building something again. So, uh, 
it, it's, I tried to time lapse the machining and other things, right? Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the crowd.